Getting ready to speak at uh, Primer 22 here, and I'll be speaking on holoptic foresight dynamics. Um, so as you could probably hear in the background, or maybe you can't, they've got the uh, introduction music on now. So we're getting ready to start uh, any minute now. And of course, this is what we'll be also talking about at the Transformations Conference. So really looking forward to it, giving you guys a behind the scene. Come on in and join me. Here we go. Two minutes now but I had to start the recording already because the camera keeps wanting to go off and on we'll see what happens um, I can always reach over and try to turn it back on during the thing we'll see what happens so if it goes off hopefully it keeps recording they've done a good job with the conference of course the conference this year has had uh, you know like uh, oh gosh um, Jay McGonigal, uh, Joseph Voris. I'm actually the last speaker, but tonight Joseph Voris is gonna do like a closing keynote. Um, yeah, there's just been so many good speakers this year. A lot of, a lot of designers, but you know, this is a Design Features Institute uh, initiative, so they're thinking about foresight and you know, how to merge uh, design and foresight together. So um, this is our third time speaking at the Primer Conference. This should be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down a limb and say this will be the best. <laughs> my favorite topic so hi everybody welcome back i hope you have enjoyed our last panel and now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next keynote speaker frank spencer in 2009 frank founded kitsch a global foresight innovation and a strategic design firm which pioneered the Future School, a foresight learning ecosystem. Through his career, Frank has worked as a leadership coach and developer with the entrepreneur, social communities, networking initiatives, and SMEs, helping them in areas such as development, innovation, and networking. He holds a Master's of Art in Strategic Foresight from Regent University. With a strong background in both business and academic foresight, Frank was the creator and lead instructor of Futures Institute, shaping the future now at Duke University's Talent Identification Program Institute, teaching students to use futures thinking and foresight to develop transformative solutions to grand challenges. He has worked on strategic foresight projects for companies such as Kraft, Morse, Marriott, and the Walt Disney Company. He's a prolific speaker, having delivered presentations to groups and conferences around the globe for over the last 20 years. Fran holds membership in the in World Future Society and Association for Professional Futurists. Fran, welcome to Primer 2022. The stage is yours. Oh, it's an honor to be here, everyone. It's so good that you're all here, and um, I'm excited to see the success of Primer this year. The team has done a wonderful job, so I just want to give a shout out to everyone. And all the speakers have been amazing. As a matter of fact, I might um, dredge up the names of a couple of them during my presentation, too, because uh, some of what has already been spoken on has really been impactful in terms of what I want to speak on today, uh, which is holoptic 
foresight dynamics. What in the world does that mean? But we're going to find out in just a minute. Um, so let's get started. As uh, Javier was saying, I was trying to make him laugh during his introduction. I saw him giggling a little bit. Um, my name is Frank Spencer, and he's already told you all about what we do. Of course, you see the Future School here today because um, Kedge is sort of the mothership, um, but the Future School is the learning ecosystem where we have taught uh, people across the globe in 45, 50 different countries live, and then many more countries than that, uh, virtually, especially during the last couple of years, um, in all kinds of different courses. Um, we have a foundations course, and of course, the Natural Foresight Framework is uh, the unique trademark framework to the Feature School, but now it's open source, an open source framework, so we're super excited about that. And I threw this slide up here at the beginning just to say that this is sort of the core beliefs of the Feature School, and the reason I checkmarked two of these today is because um, they really relate to our topic on holoptic foresight dynamics. Don't worry, I'm going to explain what that means. Um, it's a... Um, uh, philosophy and a practice that uh, us at uh, the Future School have been working on for 12 years or so now, um, but just during the last couple of years, we've really taken it out to the public, and you're going to see more and more of this as time goes on. So one of these core beliefs is that the future is about people. I often like to say the future is not about technology to a group, and then I hear all the air get sucked out of the room. Um, but uh, the reason for that is because technology can be sort of just that obvious, you know, the Jetsons and where's my jetpack and, you know, where's my flying car? And that's what people think foresight's all about. Um, but really, in the end, if it's not about people, if it's not about life, it's not about the planet, then we're really missing uh, the point. And so we have to put people at the center of this. And then you'll see number nine, increasing complexity is not our enemy. You're going to hear me expound on this in the next, you know, 40 minutes or so. Um, but I really uh, believe, and I'm going to demonstrate to you, that complexity is a sign of a maturing universe. And so we often uh, you know, com confuse complexity with complication, which is something we do to ourselves. And I know there's models out there that talk about moving from simplicity to complication, um, to complexity, and maybe even to chaos. Um, but I think that we can look at it a little bit differently today and understand that complexity is actually our friend. It gives us an opportunity from which we can create amazing um, new uh, opportunities and designs and ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to see a lot of other voices today during my presentation echoing that sentiment. And so I want to start off by just saying that a lot of what we've been seeing over the last couple of days and at other conferences that are about foresight as well, this, this one is very unique, that's why I love Primer, is how do we think like a futurist? And there's a lot of good books out there uh, right now and, and, and articles and, and things you can download for free off the internet that really talk about how to think like a futurist. Cicely Summers teaches at the University of uh, Houston and has been a futurist for a long time. Several years ago, wrote a book, Think, how, uh, think Like a Futurist. Um, of course, you see um, here, you know, Marina Gorbis at IFTF, and we've had a couple of IFTF uh, speakers during Primer as well, um, as well as Amy Webb. Many futurists have, you know, published works on how to think like a futurist, and um, that's great because oftentimes it's, you know, this is the mindset we need to have, and these are the tools that we use and the methodologies, but is there more to thinking like a futurist just than that? And of course, that's, you know, those are great books and great articles, but they just scratch the surface. Because I would ask, think like a futurist, but what kind of futurist or what kind of thinking? And so I just threw up on the screen here just a few of the different uh, philosophies of thought that uh, really uh, encapsulate how we might think as a futurist or ways that we need to think if we're going to think more broadly like a futurist. For instance, empiricism, knowing is derived from sensory experiences. But then there's pragmatism, knowing is uh, for immediate problem solving. And then we might delve into constructivism, new ways of knowing and new ideas are constructed through our life experiences. However, there's a post-structural way of looking at the world. Knowing comes through deconstructing and reconstructing reality. And yet there's also this idea of critical realism, that knowing involves transitive and emergent realities. And that's one of the ones I sort of want to hang on, although I think all these ways of knowing and others as well come into uh, play here. As a matter of fact, early in the conference, if you got to see the great presentation by Akash Das, 
Um, he was talking about different ways of looking at time and different ways of knowing from uh, different indigenous cultures. And I think that really plays a big role in holoptic foresight dynamics. I still haven't explained what that is yet. We're getting there. Um, because it's really about cooperating to produce the ability to see what wants to emerge. Ah, what does that mean? And when uh, we cooperate, we don't create cookie cutters. We're bringing our diversity to the table to create a unique whole. We'll get into that more in just a moment. So I'm sure that most of you have seen the movie Minority Report. And what good futurist doesn't bring up Minority Report when they're trying to talk about thinking like a futurist, right? Um, I put this up almost as tongue in cheek. Uh, but the interesting thing about this slide is that this is not how we think like a futurist. Um, we're not predicting and we're not, you know, um, precogs uh, that can see what is going to uh, absolutely 100% come down the line. However, there is a beautiful metaphor in this idea of being a precog. If you've never seen Minority Report, what are you doing at this conference? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but... Uh, but nonetheless, in the movie, the precogs, they could see together, together, if you took one precog out of the pool, the chain was broken. But together, collectively, cooperatively, collaboratively, together, they could see what was going to come or what was going to merge. Is that remotely a possibility for us? I'm going to tell you that it is. Watch this. So... I wrote an article a few years ago called How to Democratize or It's Time to Democratize the Future. And that sounds great. We've heard a lot of people saying that. We at TFS love to say uh, that our, one of our missions and goal is to democratize the future, to get it into the hands of as many people as possible. If we all thought this way, the world would be a better place. And there's many people that don't on a daily basis have the ability to think about the future. They're not given the right to even think about the future. As a matter of fact, uh, for those of us who are at this conference right now, we're privileged. We are at a conference where we're talking about the future and how to think about the future and how to unfold the future and what that might mean. And it's a privilege because many people around the world on a daily basis are just trying to think about how to get through today or even to think about yesterday. And so we need to make it not a privilege, but a right that everybody can think about the future. And that's why I believe that instead of the future being something that we download into ourselves or into one another or into somebody else, our job is to unlock the future from within, to allow that ability, that capability, maybe I would even say a trait, uh-huh, we're going to get into it in just a minute here, um, that we can all think about the future. How do we unlock that? And why has it been locked up till now if that's the case? If we, if we naturally can think this way, if it's an organic trait, then why has it been locked away? Well, Daniel Christian Wall gives us a little bit of an insight to this um, in his great book, Designing Regenerative Cultures. And he says, we all have the ability to know and experience the world through thinking, sensing, feeling, intuition. Good foresight is based on all these ways of knowing. It builds on our ability to anticipate a variety of future scenarios, which are not only based on our understanding of current systemic dynamics and trends, but also our sensing, our feeling, our intuiting into the future potential of the present moment. The practice of foresight and anticipation strengthens our awareness of potential future states. So wait, let me just hear that one more time. Uh, Daniel, what did you say there? That the practice of foresight as we practice it, it strengthens our awareness of potential future states. Well, you might say, of course, that's just a really fancy and nice way of saying that foresight helps us to see, you know, other potential alternative futures. But I think there's more that Daniel is saying here, rather than just saying that if we, you know, write scenarios or we, you know, design, you know, potential, uh, you know, speculative designs that we can think about alternatives. I think there's more to the story. And maybe Anthony Hodgson in his book, Systems Thinking for a Turbulent World, helps us to understand that a little bit better. When he says, if we suspend the deterministic worldview, it leads us to the interesting proposition that the insights we seek I'm going to skip a few words here, need to be so different from our current insights that perhaps they are in some sense located in the future. I actually was having a discussion with some people on uh, LinkedIn yesterday, and I heard one of the speakers at Primer say, um, some say that the future doesn't exist. 
And I believe that the future does exist today. So which is it? Does the future exist or doesn't exist? And maybe both are true. But n- nonetheless, those things that we need to change our systems by today that are broken, that are antiquated, that are outdated, they exist in some sense in the future and they can only be located there. To detect them in the future, we need to cultivate a capability for future consciousness. And he ends by saying future consciousness is in its basic form, the capacity to perceive the future in the present. And through this exercise, we develop the capacity for anticipation. That's gonna be a big part of the rest of what we wanna talk about today because I want to let you know, and maybe many of you already do know, that nature anticipates and that we are a part of nature. And so the question then is why isn't, just like nature organically anticipates Why is it anticipation an organic trait for us? And I would say that it actually is, but there are things that keep it locked away. And then we think that futures thinking and foresight is just a practice that we have to download into people. We're gonna be able to democratize foresight when we see it as something that we unlock from within across humanity because it's a natural trait. Um, uh, One of my favorite futures, Ilka Tuomi, sort of expounds on this a little bit by saying that to think like a future is to understand that the nature of the future is changing, that it morphs. So in a lot of foresight, we really look at the future, according to Ilka, um, from what he might call epistemic uncertainty. It's a big fat phrase that simply means, hmm, if I just had more information about the topic that I'm really trying to investigate I would understand it better. I'm just lacking data. I'm just lacking information. Let me gather some more information, more trends, you know, understand these things better, and then I'll understand uh, the future better. But Ilka says, not, uh, 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 not so fast, because if the nature of the future evolves and changes in novel ways, then there is no data and there is no thing to latch onto to say that this is the way it's going to change. We could talk all day long that we want to about that the future is encapsulated in the present. But if we don't really understand um, how the present might morph and change from the myriad of interactions and ideas that are colliding and converging and clashing with one another, then we don't understand the way that it will change, the nature of the future will change. And so he calls that ontological unpredictability, that the very nature of the future is changing and shifting. And so... If we're going to be able to see that, we have to be able to see not the trends of what's right in front of us. We have to somehow be able to perceive what wants to emerge, what desires to emerge. Um, One of the biggest problems, not necessarily with the futures field, but just with humanity in general, is that we're desperate to uh, know for sure and to control what is coming instead of flowing with the cosmos, what wants to emerge, what wants to unfold. And this is a greater sense of future consciousness. This is what Hodgson was talking about. This is what Wall's talking about. How to perceive what wants to emerge. How do we do that? So Rion Miller, of course, talking about futures literacy a great deal, says that a futures literate person is able to detect and attribute meaning to novelty and complex emergence. Becoming more futures literate can enhance human efforts to sense and make sense of complexity. Echoing what I said early on, Rial says that complexity is not a bad thing. It's the natural element. It's the natural organic way. It's the maturing of the universe. And so when we understand complexity in that way, we seek it out for what it wants to give us, what wants to emerge. And we actually see here uh, John Stewart uh, giving us a great example or um, uh, a representation of how evolution actually unfolds. It might start from more simple beginnings, but as uh, diversity um, really comes together and collides, different people, different ideas um, that were uh, actually having responsive processes with one another, and they're integrated together they move towards a greater, more complex global entity, a higher level of systemic complexity. And if that's the case, then that means that we need to tap into that systemic complexity in order to be really good future thinkers and to really unlock the future from within. So now let's bring it back to design. Since we are at Primer and there's a lot of designers in the room, I love this uh, quote from this Fast Company article uh, many years ago, actually. Design thinking needs to think bigger. And we all have, you know, our feelings about design thinking, right? Good and bad. 
Um, but I love this article. Um, Hiritaka says, the more complex an organism is, the more capable it becomes. We're not trying to fight complexity through uh, futures thinking and futures design and design futures. We're actually trying to evolve with it. We're trying to co-create alongside of it. And the more capable it is, the more it can address challenges and seize opportunities. And so um, one of uh, my favorite physicist thinkers, Fritjof Capra, sort of echoes this as well, talking about that evolutionary process where diversity and integration leads us to a greater global, global entity of higher systemic complexity. And that complexity gives us greater ability to co-create the future. He says, evolution should no longer be seen or is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather a cooperative, I want you to remember that word cooperative, very important, a cooperative dance in which creativity and constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. Remember, we all talking about this novelty, Ilka saying novelty, the nature of the future is changing. It's through this cooperative dance that we are able to grasp the emergent novelty that is trying to unfold. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks, and patterns of organization, a new science of quality is emerging. That's beautiful. And last but not least, my friend Nora Bateson, I love Nora. Many of you, uh, if, if you've never seen her speak before, you know, she, I think she's brilliant. And of course, you know, she carries on the lineage at the Bateson Institute of her father and her grandfather. And in a recent paper called An Essay on Reading, Nora says, complexity of living systems is characterized by multi-contextual, constant, responsive change. And while change is predictably constant, it is unpredictable in direction and often occurs at second and nth orders of systemic rationality or relationality. So what makes a living system ready to change? Before the change, there is a coalescence of factors and experiences that produce an undeterminable readying instead of action. Mm. What if, instead of thinking of a theory of change being produced from an identified preferred goal or an outcome, trying to arrive at something, seeing where we're trying to go, where, what's the end game? Which is what a lot of future thinking is all about, right? What if instead the focus was placed on the way in which a system becomes ready for undetermined change? Can unforeseen readiness be nourished? While linear managing or controlling of direction of change may appear desirable, tending to how the system becomes ready allows for pathways of possibility previously unimagined. Back to what Ilka says again, um, ontological unpredictability. As a matter of fact, I would put it this way. In future thinking, we shouldn't always be thinking about the end. Our goal is to be thinking about the beginnings, not just the endings. More important than endings are beginnings because they tell us what is potential, what is hidden, what is liminal, what wants to unfold. And is there a way for us to possibly do that? Well, remember I told you this word cooperation and anticipation was very, very important. Now I'll ask here, who has seen the movie Arrival? Of course, as a good sci-fi you know, uh, uh, geek and a futurist, I have to throw in another movie reference here. And so I like to call this one Louise, General Chang, and Robert Rose in anticipation for emergence. Because Louise is, you know, played here um, in the movie you see on the screen, and General Chang, you know, was the, the, the Chinese commander in the movie. And they both, um, I don't want to spoil the movie for anybody, but there's going to be a little bit of a spoiler here. <laughs> um, in the movie, uh, they figured out that the aliens that came to Earth, their language, if you learned it, you could begin to see what was going to come. Now, I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination that we can do that. However, nature does sort of do that, by the way. And Robert Rosen, a great biologist, taught us all about anticipation. When he said an anticipatory system is a natural system that contains an internal predictive model of itself. The presence of a predictive model serves foresight precisely to pull the future into the present. Let's say that again, to pull the future into the present. That's what uh, um, anticipatory systems do. Um, if we're going to have that kind of model that we can work off of as the human species, that's going to require an entirely new paradigm, an anticipatory paradigm. And I love, love, love this phrase where he says, organisms that are anticipatory seem capable of constructing an internal. What did I say about unlocking from within, not from without? 
but from within, an internal surrogate for time as a part of a model that can indeed be manipulated to produce anticipation. In particular, this internal surrogate of time must run faster than real time. And that is the future that is within us. As a matter of fact, the poet uh, uh, Maria Rilke said, the future enters into us to work within us before it's released through us to do its, uh, to do its bidding or do its will. I'm paraphrasing there a bit, but the future within. Um, and so in biology, you know, and nature provides us with huge existence proofs of um, anticipatory uh, processes and models, internal surrogates of time. Why don't our systems work that way? Why don't our companies work that way? Our businesses work that way? Our governments work that way? What are we doing so wrong if the rest of the cosmos works through an internal surrogate of time to cooperate and understand what wants to emerge, what's trying to emerge, the beginnings? Well, that's a great question and something that seems like we need to fix if we're going to you know, get things right. Um, you can sort of understand how we get off the path when we look at biology as a thing or a substance. And that might be called, you know, substance biology or, you know, identification biology. But when you look at biology or ontology, by the way, the word ontology just means the nature of being. What the, the, it's something's nature. What does it mean to be? Um, then process biology or process ontology is a different way of looking at the world. Because instead of looking at objects like there's a lizard and there's a plant and there's a car and there's a thing, which is a lot of what we do, especially even in foresight, we do that. You know, let me, there's 3D printing and there's NFTs and there's the metaverse. Instead of understanding the process of things, that our goal is not to really point to a thing as much as the process that nature and the universe and the cosmos is going through to unfold what wants to emerge for health, for prosperity, for generativity of the cosmos of all living things. And so we need to understand this interplay between the different parts, the cooperation, the cooperative dance, as Fritjof Capra already told us, um, around the objects and the subjects, the process being more important, that leads us to what wants to unfold, what wants to emerge in those beginnings. But that's not all. If you know that there's this new uh, uh, sort of field that's been around for a little while, but there's a lot more people talking about what might be known today as biocosmology. And it's the idea of process um, ontology or biology on steroids. Because biocosmology really says that um, we've got this a little bit backwards. We thought that our little tiny ball, the earth, um, that has life on it, um, really was just, you know, not driving the cosmos very much. And then we can look out in the cosmos and we see black holes and we see all of this stuff going on that we know of so far. Maybe we'll know, you know, more in the, in the near and far future about what's going on out there. But um, the, we see entropy is really that driving, that major driving force. Now, I'm not saying that entropy is not a major driving force. It doesn't exist. Obviously, it is. But biocosmology actually adds a fourth uh, law of, um, of motion and matter on and says that if you understand um, the interactions between the different species and parts of life and, and, and the complex responsive processes that are going on when things are, are moving, those interactions in between create an incredible number of possibilities and potentialities and new novel futures, novel realities. More so than we can by science, and I'm not, a, I'm not this kind of scientist, so it's on the screen for you if you want to see it, but the numbers are astronomical um, just for life on Earth for what can be produced than what we know off of the planet. And so biocosmology actually asserts with great um, evidence and proof that life is the driving force of the universe. Life is the driving force of the universe. And life is extending and the entropy isn't the death, but it's only the beginning of a new piece of life. And so through biocosmology, we can understand this incredible, incredible um, uh, way that life is trying to unfold and speak to us and say something to us and emerge. But can we shift our mindset from look what came or look what manifested to look what wants to manifest, look what's trying to manifest. We're anticipating it and we understand how to co-create alongside instead of trying to control and dominate. Uh, it's a different way to look at futures. So we're getting there now, closer to what we might call holoptic foresight dynamics.
And this uh, diagram on the screen really shows um, how we traditionally approach futures or foresight thinking or design from the inside out. So in that inner circle, you see future as a time, which is the most common way we see things. Oh, uh, you know, this is going to happen 10 years from now. Uh, what's going to happen two years from now? Oh my gosh, what might things look like 50 years from now? And that's usually how we do our foresight and futures work. Um, but uh, Sohail in Yatala um, is fond of saying we need to get past time and think of futures as a place or space. It's much more helpful because when we do that, we don't just say, oh, that's 10 years from now. I'm not going to worry about it right now. I've got things to do today. We're running on a treadmill. we got fires to put out. But instead, we see the future as a place inhabited with life, with trees, with rivers, with people, with ideas, with innovations. Uh, so it's much more helpful when we model our futures thinking as a place rather than as a time. And of course, we're talking about experiences of time here. And so this is a way for us to supersede or transcend time. But I would say that we can transcend both time and space, just as our uh, anticipatory um, brothers and sisters throughout nature does an internal, internal surrogate of time that runs faster than time. Future staking, when it's internal and it's cooperative and it's anticipatory, allows us to transcend time and space and to have an internal encounter with the future. So above time and space is an encounter with the future, which actually allows us to both internalize it, anticipate it, build those anticipatory models for it, and to uh, co-create with it in a way that allows us to see the future in a way that time and space locks us down by its um, barriers and biases and the way that we think that you know things are siloed and segregated and locked away and partitioned. That doesn't have to be that way when we view uh, foresight and futures from an encounter, an internal, biological, trait-focused um, and trait-driven um, and encounter with the future. So here is uh, where we get to the holoptic foresight dynamics. Yes, of course, it's a, it's a gif or gif, however you want to say this, of my beautiful dragonfly. And why did we suddenly leave, you know, Nora Bateson and Wall and, you know, Capra and all the famous people and, 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 and the, the shoulders of giants that we're standing on. And now we're looking at a dragonfly here, Frank. What's going on? Well, the dragonfly is actually the star of the whole show. Um, because the dragonfly actually has what's called a holoptic eye. You see that big eye on the whole head of the dragonfly? It's a holoptic eye. It's much different from a human eye. The human eye looks straight, looks forward, has great capability, but sees one direction at a time. Dragonflies actually have this holoptic eye across their entire field of vision, across their entire head. And they, through these many, many, many tiny uh, you know, partitions in the eye, have a 360 degree view of the world. They can see forward, backwards, up, down, sideways. And the important thing is all at the same time, could you imagine if we saw everything at the same time? It'd probably drive you crazy, right? But their vision has been built so that they can do that. And not only that, but when the dragonfly sees uh, 360 degrees all at the same time, it causes an amazing biological phenomenon. So go study the dragonfly. You're going to love this. Dragonflies can actually sense milliseconds before something is about to happen that it is going to happen. And there's an amazing video, I don't have it here for you today, online about um, this dragonfly's ability where they take a pea shooter, they actually shoot, you know, a, a, I think a dead fly or maybe just a, a paper ball out, I don't know. And there's a dragonfly on uh, a reed in the distance. And they've actually showed slowing it down that before the fly or the, 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 the piece of paper ever leaves the straw completely, the dragonfly already starts to turn its head, sensing because it has a 360 degree view of its um, you know, environment. So that's you know, literally physical, but I'm not suggesting that we're ever able to be able to do that. But what we can do is have an internal dragonfly's eye. We can have a holoptic foresight dynamic. And that the definition of holoptic foresight would be the cooperative. Why is it cooperative? Because we have to have lots of eyes. Holoptic means many eyed. I have to have you, you have to have me, and we better democratize the future 
Because I need the voices that aren't spoken right now to be a part of that I. Without those voices, without the indigenous ways of knowing, multiple ways of knowing, people that aren't able to think about the future all the time, I am missing my holotic I. I do not have the full cooperation that allows an evolutionary trait of complex emergence perception to unfold that will lead us all to the co-creation of novelty and transformative realities. Bringing it all together, holoptic foresight dynamics, the cooperative evolutionary trait. Now, you might be saying to me right now, hey, look, Frank, you're not a biologist. What are you talking about here? Evolutionary science and all this good stuff. Well, I am a geek, but you're right. I'm not an evolutionary science or a biologist. Um, but I will tell you that, as we've already shown and we've you know, been able to demonstrate today, and there's so much more research that goes behind this. Um, I'll, we'll be sharing this actually live at the Anticipation Conference in Phoenix in a couple of months. And I'm going to share the end of this that we're actually leaving tomorrow to go to a holoptic retreat um, in California. We'll be, be working with a group of people um, on this very idea. Um, but what I am sharing is that for many years, we've looked at evolution as a competitive fight and flight dynamic. And we say, oh, well, we're just, you know, we're just base and you know humans are just base and our, our our base instincts and and we run away and we think about the past mostly and we're fight and flight and we, you know everything's about competition but we've been learning increasingly and most evolutionists now will say that competition is not the main driver of evolution it's cooperation and that doesn't mean that we all become the same thing we bring our diversity to the table to the table to create a holoptic unique eye a unique whole that allows us organically and naturally to perceive what wants to emerge. And that leads us to co-create alongside of the cosmos instead of trying to command and control our way into the future. And as I said, I just threw this in here because, gosh, there's been so much study over the last 12, 15 years on holoptic foresight. Um, but you're only hearing about it now because, you know, we've worked on this for a long time and just over the last two years been releasing this. But I can tell you that if you want, um, uh, if anybody here is interested in, in a sort of a resource of all the books that uh, we use for this, um, then we've got, you know, all kinds of research behind it. So here's a great way to look at it. Um, traditionally, we often have what I might call a monoptic site. And that is top down. Leaders see the actors and players. Leaders lead and they control the actions of everybody else. That's a monoptic way of seeing the world. But you've heard probably a lot of talk about, well, we're more in a panoptic way of seeing the world now. Or uh, I think uh, Jaime Cassio calls it a panopticon. Um, and this is when sort of like the Foucaultian jailer. I'm, you know, I can see all of the people around me in a 360 degree uh, you know, uh, radius. I can see what, what, what all's going on. I'm Mark Zuckerberg on Facebook. I can see all of you and I control you like puppets, but you can't see me. So, um, so that's a very panoptic view of the world. I'm being controlled by somebody who has a 360 degree uh, vision of the world. And that, if you think about it, is how a lot of our systems work today. Top down, but a more panoptic view, seeing the whole, but the whole doesn't see back to the middle again. A holoptic view is very different tears down the walls of um, those barriers and the command and control. And the whole, this unique, holoptic, many-eyed, cooperative, evolutionary, unique uh, 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 entity, us, us, works together in a processual biology, a processual ontology, a cooperative evolutionary trait that allows us to see what wants to unfold, to see what's trying to emerge, to understand the beginnings instead of the endings. That is futures consciousness. That is futures consciousness. And so just to give you a little bit of a definition of what holoptic foresight really is, it's an awareness by the parts within a system of their individual diversity, as well as that diversity's role in creating a complex emerging whole, a unique entity, an extended evolutionary purpose. Perception by that cooperative whole, comprised of people, nodes, actor structures, etc., of complex emerging novelties, and the co-creation of the complex emerging novelty that leads to transformational realities. It's a beautiful thing, people. And so I drew this sort of as an eye, if you see sort of metaphor here, but we can look at it as a recursive loop of intentional evolution. Um, while we're uh, cooperating in futures consciousness, 
That gives us the ability to dive into our collective anticipatory internal surrogate of time um, that allows us to then co-create complex emergent novelties. And once those are co-created, it gives us greater insight into what wants to emerge and greater cooperation among the whole. So this means that the future is encountered, the future is unlocked, and the future is then pulled to us. Encountered above time and space, unlocked from within, pulled toward us as the cosmos is beckoning us to create alongside of it for a more healthy vision and view of the future. So you can just see here how the dragonfly's eye, that many-eyed um, view of the world, helps us in ways uh, that would be resource savvy and, and uh, regenerative, um, life-giving. Um, our governance can be this way. Um, our you know, purpose in life can be this way. Our worldviews can be this way. And it creates very, very different systems than the ones we have today. It really is a push towards intentional evolution. Most of our push towards intentional evolution has all been technological. I'm wearing a, a watch. I have, you know, a headset on, my VR headset. I'm in the metaverse now. Um, but we haven't really thought about these greater technologies of biology. The cosmos and biology is the greatest technological inventor of all time. And we've bypassed those technologies to try to get to our technologies, which aren't wrong. Technologies are always a good thing. It's a helpmate. But when we elevate technology, synthetic technology, to be our master instead of our servant, then, we un th then we've missed the point of the greater biological technology that allows us to intentionally evolve into what it means to be a new human species, to what it means to move through that biocosmetic idea of life, generating more life and emerging a new reality among us. And so I would ask you and leave you with this today. Is it possible to intentionally cultivate foresight as a cooperative, evolutionary human trait? Hmm. If so, could this also lead us to an evolutive futures orientation that's biological, that's neurological, that's cognitive, that's mimetic, that's not just tools and methods? Tools and methods are important. We use them all the time. We have clients, as you know, Javier said, introducing me at the beginning, um, all over the world, and they want to know the tools and methodologies. But behind that is the really transformative part of foresight. And that's why we've seen people go to programs and trainings and you know, you're just teaching them foresight and afterwards they're in tears. Why? We had somebody yesterday in a library's training that said, my life was literally changed. <laughs> I thought, what in the world's going on? And this is what's actually going on with some of those people, not everyone, but some of them. They're really resonating at a deeper internal uh, place where foresight, without them even knowing, is becoming something that's biological that is a part of our very nature. And so I would, of course, say, yes, it's possible to do this, but it's going to require that we practice within a new paradigm of governance, organizational development, and social dynamics, cultivating HFD, holoptic foresight dynamics, as you now will know it, will require a new mindset, a new vision, and a brand new approach to what it means to be human. So I told you um, that I'm leaving on a plane tomorrow morning for California. I'm in Orlando, Florida, by the way. And um, we have our first ever um, live and in-person uh, HFD retreat called Transformations of Natural Foresight. Natural Foresight because um, that is the uh, framework that is being used by companies around the world now uh, through Kedge and uh, the future schools uh, work with those companies. It's um, a beautiful, beautiful uh, framework that's based on natural and organic panarchical ways of looking at the world instead of sta stair steps or, or numbers or um, you know a linear way of approaching things. It's a much more organic way of approaching foresight. Um, and at this upcoming retreat, which is sadly closed, it's been closed for a while. So why am I taunting you with this then? Because there's going to be more of them. And as a matter of fact, there'll be upcoming webinars on HFD and transformations in natural foresight. As a matter of fact, we're creating eventually, probably sometime next year, a whole um, asynchronous course on transformations in natural foresight. Um, but one thing that is on this slide that it would be helpful to some of you here is thefutureschool.com. You can join us. Our year of free is still on. 
where we've been uh, having people um, attend one of our three-day or um, you know, six-month programs or any of the programs that we host through the learning ecosystem of TFS for free if they're nominated by somebody else. And so we've been reaching even more people around the world this year by giving away um, those trainings and those teachings this year so that we could truly democratize foresight and unlock it within people. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. It's always, always, always an honor to speak um, with the Design Futures Initiative. They've been our friends for a long time. We love these guys. They're doing a great job. And um, I'm the last voice that you'll hear in this conference, except for workshops. Oh, and by the way, uh, Voris later this evening, but I think I'm actually sort of closing out the official conference. So it was an honor um, to speak with all of you. I'm so happy uh, that I could, and thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad. I think I have a few moments to answer. Hi, Frank. Thank you so much for your talk. We all here were really interesting on your topic. And yeah, I mean, we have a few questions and a few minutes for, for you to answer. So the first one is, uh, do you consider a priority to collaboratively set a purpose towards this transformation beyond collaboratively actions to monitor and anticipate the future? So let's see, Laura, uh, my wonderful friend, if I understand um, your question here, um, but it sounds like you're talking about, you know, it, as it, that this is the priority that we need to set and it's purposeful. And that's why we talked about intentional evolution. So I would say that the answer to that is a resounding yes. And I think this is a different way than what we have looked at, you know, foresight and futures before, although not completely different. I know that I'm not the only one out there saying that foresight really is a team sport. Um, and that, uh, you know, the more that we get away from the lone genius idea and foresight and the lone genius on the stage, and I'm not saying that, you know, having somebody be on a stage, look, I'm, I'm alone on the stage right now talking and it's perfectly fine. Um, but what I really mean is that we really get it foresight when we work together and we have that diversity. And so this collaboration is something that we have to intentionally and purposefully develop. Um, it's one of the things we're going to be working on at the retreat coming up. And um, I do believe that that helps us to actually um, sort of unlock the systems that we're in now, which are an antithesis to this organic um, evolutionary trait. And to get back to what we really should be doing, we're a part of nature. We've forgotten that. We've dissociated humanity from nature, but we're nature. And so we have to understand that we're working with all of nature for this to happen. And the rest of nature is way ahead of us. So. Right. Thanks, Frank. Uh, there is another question. Uh, how can non-futurists cultivate holoptic mindsets? Your communities and amongst themselves? Yes, absolutely. That's a, I love that, Valeria. That's a great question. And of course, it has to be non futurist. It has to be everybody. As a matter of fact, that's why I start off with we have to democratize foresight. Uh, are the future. I don't think that means that everybody needs to become a trained and practicing futurist, but we need to let everybody know that they have this capacity to unlock this evolutionary trait of futuring and foresighting uh, from within themselves. And uh, that's going to look different from different people. And we actually see a lot of things out there now that are happening that are already foresight related that I think people in the field who are trained like myself might not, you know, recognize immediately as being foresight. But one of the things that we're doing right now is we're starting holoptic communities of practice. And so you can uh, join our, um, you know, go to our website. You might not see anything there right now, but go look at the transformations of natural foresight piece and, and bookmark it. And, and, and we'll be coming back to it soon because we're going to be holding some um, uh, you know, communities of practice around HFD coming up. And I believe that it does have to start in our communities, but across communities today. And we have this wonderful opportunity through the net um, and even as we're sharing with one another today and people around the world are watching this um, to cooperate in ways that we never did before. So we're at a moment in human history where this makes even more sense than maybe it ever did before. And I saw Akash, you know, further back up um, asking me a question. I forget what it was, but um, but he said, you know, let's get some holopticism to our futures, collective, cooperative and co-creative. I couldn't agree more, Akash. So thank you, my friend. Okay. Well, Frank, again, thank you for your time and for presenting us all this information on Primer 22. Uh, we are about to start the last segment of the day, so keep in touch. Can't wait. Thank you so much. And for those who might be in anticipation in November, I'll see you there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Well, that's it. The puppy scratched at the door. That's scratching at the door. <laughs> Primer 22 is over. I was the last speaker. Well, Vora speaks tonight. Um, but uh, hopefully we got some, uh, hopefully we got some, uh, you know, wow, I finished right on time a minute before. Uh, so hopefully we got some good shots in there of behind the scenes um, with holoptic foresight and transformation. So uh, I, we'll see if this experiment worked. Turn on the camera on the side, but um, hope you all enjoyed it.